Welcome to the Analytics Engineering Podcast, featuring conversations with practitioners inventing the future of analytics engineering. Welcome to the show. I'm Tristan Handy. And I'm Julia Schottenstein. On this episode, we're going to hear from Robert Chang, who is a product manager for the data platform at Airbnb. He's also spent time as a data scientist at Twitter and the Washington Post. Robert regularly publishes amazing content about data science and data engineering, and recently wrote about Airbnb's Minerva platform, the metrics layer that powers all of Airbnb's data products. Wow, I'm super excited for this episode because I feel like metrics store is the word du jour. Everyone is talking about it. What do you think, Tristan? Is this the next big thing in data? So I think that that metric store is really interesting, and I I'm, I love this conversation. I'm excited for folks to be able to listen to it. The thing that I want to say first, though, is that for those of us who have followed Airbnb's contributions to data over the years, this felt a little bit like talking to a star, and I was a little bit starstruck. Like the folks at Airbnb have been living in the future for the rest of us, and they they still very much are living in the future. They have access to tooling that the rest of the ecosystem just doesn't yet. And so I was a little bit just excited to hear what his life was like on a day-to-day basis in this new world. Yeah, I think they've been living that dream of unbundling the data stack for a long time. And they've been really thoughtful about how do they build data products, who are the consumers of their data products. And it feels like the rest of the world is just playing catch up. And so that's why I think Metric Store and Minerva specifically is really exciting because it gives us a lens into how they architect their entire data platform. It's their central nervous system at Airbnb. It's going to be a good episode. We'll learn a little bit more about what other companies can do, what's a good way to organize your data stack. And if you don't have the resources like Airbnb has, what's the best next alternative that you can employ? Like you said, Tristan, we'll be talking to a star. This one's going to be a fun episode. Certainly, we've learned a lot from Robert Chang over the past few years from his writing. And it was a a huge honor to have him on the show. So let's hear what he has to say. Robert, thanks so much for joining us. This is going to come out in the questions that I ask you, but I just want to go on the record as saying that your blog post back in 2015 was a lifesaver for me Wow! because I was curating a newsletter called the Data Science Roundup and feeling like I don't actually know what it's like to be a data scientist, (laughs) but here's this guy who's at Twitter who's like telling the entire world. And I feel like that post actually created kind of a genre. Like there have been a bunch of people after the fact, who have written like, here's what it's like to be a data scientist at X company. So thanks for sharing your wisdom there. And you've done a lot of that over the years. I'm really curious, what was the reaction like to that post? And it was well received. Did you get messages? Did it impact your career? Yeah, it definitely a sizable impact to my career, mostly related to my external brand. Although I would admit that when I wrote that post back in 2015, it was really oh i mean i wasn't really trying to be famous or anything i was just i found it very odd that people who are practicing data science all have the same questions and people have been talking about it for i mean all the time and it it seems odd to me that there are so many talented people in in the industry that's in the field that nobody has ever shared about their experience and I don't know. I I, I have this always have this habit that if you you know i embark on a journey and i feel like after a while i I feel like I get it. I, this is the mental model. I have this huge urge to write it down. And that has been my sort of guiding principle for a lot of my blog posts. That's why I don't write that often because you don't have epiphanies like, you know, every other day. But I guess that style turns out to be useful for many people. And so that definitely gave me more drive to keep writing. I'm so glad you mentioned your proclivity to write. Not everybody in your position is as much of a writer as you are, but I think folks talk frequently about how important writing and communication more broadly is as a data scientist. Is that just a thing that you've always done? Did you develop your voice? Like, it was this intentional? Yeah, I think it's very much tied to my personality. Um, I I sometimes joke that I I have OCD, 
about documenting my own learnings. If I don't document them, I don't feel like I've learned. I do, you know, personal reflection and all that. And I, I always have been pretty structured in terms of in terms of organizing my thoughts. And I think that I didn't realize that, but I think that it definitely helps when it comes to my writing. It's like I always try to figure out kind of what is the right structure to organize my learning and my thoughts. And I think that I really help people, especially for those who are also kind of struggling on the same path and struggling like I was. I, I think that that sort of writing style definitely helps, uh, especially those who are also trying to learn and figure out what's going on. And sorry to be cheesy here. One of our values as a company at Fishtown Analytics is we are human. Um, so it's one of my goals to always get to know the, the human behind the work. Um, if you don't mind, I have a couple rapid fire questions for you. Of course, go ahead. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in Taiwan. Siblings? Yes, one elder sister. Have you moved across state lines during COVID? I have not. I have not. Almost everybody that I talk to these days, uh, the answer to that question is yes, but you've, you've stayed in one place. Okay. Imagine that you're 80. What's the one pandemic story that you're going to tell all the kids when they ask about what it was like? Oh, man, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, I would tell them to imagine what it likes to work from home in the same bedroom where you sleep and eat for like a year and a half. <laughs> yeah. How many square feet is the box that you've been living in for the past year? Ah, uh, Too small. Not enough. What do you spend time on outside of work? Uh, I read a lot. I'm a runner, so I run a lot as well. You have written a lot about your time at Twitter and at Airbnb, but your bio has a very interesting year on it at the Washington Post. You might have written about this and I might not have found it, but I'd love to hear you talk about that year and what data looked like in publishing back at that time, because I'm sure it's pretty different to your experiences at, at Airbnb and Twitter. Oh, very different. First of all, it was in a different industry. Second of all, it was also, it was the year of 2012. I didn't write that much about the Washington Post experience because I was only there for a year, but actually that year of my work experience actually has a very profound impact on me and the way that I look at data in general. I briefly mentioned in my like data engineering series where I talked about how naive I was when I, you know, Washington Post was my first job. And then like many other aspiring data scientists, people want to do fancy stuff like machine learning and AI and all that. And that, that was already a thing back then. People like still nowadays for people who are in school, they have a sometimes an overly romanticized view of the industry. And I, I definitely was in that camp as well. And I actually spent a lot of my time doing analytics engineering. In fact, my title was analytics engineer. And I was like, I don't really know what this is. I want a title of data sciences. I was very naive back then. And so I got the title, but then my day-to-day -day work is actually doing what we call analytics engineering now. Which is, I'm sure, not a totally unique experience for new data science hires. I think it's probably pretty universal. And I think once I got to Twitter and at Airbnb, I, I just realized that if you want to do data, you can't just do what's in the top of the pyramid. And then whenever I talk to people, I always reference to like Monica's the hierarchy of data science. Mm -hmm. That's just a brilliant articulation of how you do data. Like you have to build it from the foundation and upward. And it actually, even though it was just a short one year, I think that was a very valuable experience for me to understand, okay, this is really what it takes. And this is why I kind of, you can say that I gradually go down the stack from the like top of the pyramid and then and then more and more so like focus on infrastructure and that led to my current role. Probably the last thing that you would have expected when you were doing a master's degree in statistics. Exactly. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing all your background, Robert. Super exciting to have you here on the podcast. And I think we're, we're going to get into the meat of it today. You know, we're all really excited about metrics. There's a lot of buzz about it in the industry. Certainly a lot of talk about it in the Fishtown Analytics Slack. And you've done really excellent work about building Minerva at Airbnb. I'd love for you to set the stage, give us some definitions to start with on what exactly is a metric store for our audience. Yeah, the infrastructure that I, I helped to build at Airbnb is called Minerva. And essentially, it's what we now call a metric store. And a metric store, if I want to put it succinctly, it's basically a single source of truth metric repository where users can define metrics and dimensions once, and then they can use it everywhere, be it analytics, experimentation, or reporting. And that's sort of kind of for our team, our vision statement is define once use everywhere. And it's all centered around metric and, and the idea of a metric store is what make it possible. It seems like 
when you describe it as, you know, define once, use everywhere, that was really important for you at Airbnb. What exactly did the world look like before you decided to take on building Minerva? Can you describe any particular pain points you had or rough decisions you or outcomes you had without having a metric store? Just paint us a picture for what the world used to look like. Airbnb is, is a company that I think we invest a lot in data foundation. And even before Minerva, I think we did a pretty reasonable job in organizing our data warehouse. And the strategy that we took was to build what we call a set of core data tables. My understanding is that at other companies, for example, Facebook, they also have similar concepts floating around. And mostly the emphasis is on table standardization. So imagine that in a modern data day, a modern data stack, you have some sort of data lake, you have all the raw data flowing into it. It's not really usable for business analytics. So you need some sort of organization or governance uh, of cleaning transformation of some sort to make it uh, useful. And I think very naturally, the first step is always to organize at the table level, build a data model necessary, and then represent the key business entities or concepts. And then a lot of time, either you follow some sort of star schema setup or a snowflake schema. And it's very similar to like the traditional Kimball style dimensional modeling, that type of work and organizing your warehouse so that there's some sort of table standardization. And at Airbnb, we spend a lot of our time in the early days building what we call core data tables. And they have been very critical that they are very critical to the success of Airbnb's scaling Airbnb's data ecosystem. But it's really kind of a double-edged sword because when you know that these are the high quality tables to use, you then would overfit or you would leverage those tables to the extreme. And so people start building on top of those tables. And very soon you see that there's layers and layers being built on top of it. And if you don't have some sort of governance in place, then you see a lot of problems on the data production side, you know, more tables are being built uh, into the warehouse, but you don't really know if they a similar table already exists. The lineage becomes more and more complex. It makes data management very complex. If something upstream uh, has some problems and you need to kind of fix and propagate a fix downward, it just becomes a, a huge mess. And so that's just on the data production side, like a lot of manual work to maintain and make sure that the warehouse is, is in good shape. And on the data consumption side, it's the same. You know, you can have the same metric being computed by different tables using slightly different logic. And if they're not properly documented, there's a bunch of tribal knowledge and people who are consumers who don't understand the tables will just take it at face value and then they could report the wrong numbers. And over time, the trust between data consumers and the people who produce data started to degrade. And I think a key insight that we were to realize at Airbnb is it is definitely very important to have table level standardization, but it's not enough because when people consume data, they don't really consume tables. Like if you have a, your leadership team or your, if you're stakeholders, they think in terms of business questions, which are roughly translated to metrics and dimensions, not really like the underlying table that's really abstract. And so having pushing standardization to the next level from table to metrics is something that we really believe in. And that's something that we started to see about a few years ago. So we have been working on that project since 2017, so for almost four years. And more recently, uh, we've seen a lot of attention being put on a similar concept uh, in the industry. And so I think this is, I, I will venture to guess that this is where the industry is gonna go. And this, the concept of metric store will play a pretty critical role in the modern data stack. I feel like I have this need to like go to the most basic definitions. Like the term metric is so overloaded. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like you have defined a framework for a metric. What is a metric very specifically in your world? Well, let's take a specific example. For example, you know, Airbnb now is a public company. We typically have earnings call and we need to report several important top line metrics for the business. One of which is our revenue. Another is uh, Knight's book. These are all what we call metrics. Basically, these are things that are metrics are uh, sort of data points that you can plot and you can observe trends and you can understand movement. And that allows you to answer certain business questions. I don't really have a great definition here, but it's it has to be closely related to the business concepts that you have in mind, such as revenue and Knight's book. 
I didn't get from reading your post, and we'll link it in the show notes, but does a metric need to have exactly one timestamp associated with it? Can it have no timestamps? Could it have two? Um, like revenue happens on a day, but maybe some metrics don't. Right, right. For Airbnb, most of our tables are partitioned by day, which means that the majority of our metrics are computed on a daily basis. So Minerva is not a system. It, it's for the most part, a batch processing infrastructure. So there's no real time compute involved. I think your question is a great question. And I think that my answer just now is actually not a great answer because I think it depends, right? Like depending on what the business you're in. For Airbnb, we're very different from the Google, the Facebook, or even the Lyft and Uber, where the real-time nature of the business isn't really as important. A lot of our key important business metrics, having a daily batch job to compute is, is more than enough. And so for us, usually metrics are computed as a time series, and it's something that you can plot, and you can even cut it by different dimensions and observe trends so on and so forth. But I can imagine if you're at a different company like Uber or Lyft, then maybe the top line metric or the, the, the key metrics that you care about, the time granularity has to be has to be different. It seems like the stakes are really high at Airbnb, especially now when you're a public company, can't have metrics, especially historical metrics that change. And there was a need for trust amongst teams to get to the right answer. We hear that a lot. And I think it only increases as you get bigger as a company, certainly if you're a public company. So tell us, I guess, about the journey to getting to Minerva. How long did it take? What kind of resources were involved? Was it a bigger project than you first anticipated? We'd love to hear about what it actually took. It's a four-year project in the making, and we're still pushing the frontier. And the project started out in mid-2017. I was still at data science then, and I wasn't the PM of the team. But I uh, actually work with the, with the Minerva team very closely. There's actually only one engineer not even spending his full, full time working on this project. The idea is that we should be able to build a data engineering framework that bridge the gap between table and metrics. And historically at Airbnb, we already had a... Minerva is not really a concept that was born out of the blue. We had a experimentation platform. And that platform allows users to define metrics in which they can then keep track of ex experiment results. And it's called metrics repo. And the metrics repo has been very successful, but the success is only limited to the context of experimentation. And a lot of people started asking questions like, well, if we define all these metrics for uh, experimentation use cases, why couldn't we leverage it to apply to reporting or analytics and beyond? And that was actually a very valid question. That was sort of genesis, the starting point of Minerva. Minerva actually was called, internally, was called global metrics. And the idea is that defined ones use everywhere. And we want to use these metric definitions beyond just experimentation, but also in other applications as well. And so it started out in 2017. And then it took the engineer um, uh, about a year to kind of put everything in place. And starting in 2018, we started to, the turning point for us is that we, we started to identify a few very important company level reporting needs that allows us to sort of partner with them and try to help them understand the value of Minerva. And then we started working with them very, very closely. And they're basically our alpha and beta users that help us un like give us feedback on what are the kinks that need to be fixed so that eventually it can be ready for prime time. And we have been very lucky because that was also the time where Airbnb was, well, we have always been trying to prepare ourselves to go public. And so we, we were doing a lot of data readiness type of work. And one of which is, is the rebuilding of a lot of our Airbnb's data models. So around that time, basically a group of very experienced um, data practitioners at a company get together and try to rethink, okay, what is the right, what is the right architecture going forward that will serve us in the years to come? And so there's a lot of innovation in the data engineering space, but then there's clearly the question of, okay, once you have, you build all these data models, how do you translate these models and, and tables into uh, analytical data sets that's anal analysis friendly? And that is where Minerva came in because it's the it's the perfect paradigm that bridged the gap between the data engineers and the data scientists. So 
by working with them, we onboarded a few very important use cases at Airbnb. And in 2019, we just keep, you know, hardening our metric infrastructure. We try to drive adoption and we build other sort of, we build the, the Minerva API, which allows uh, more users to connect to our data metric store and to build more innovative applications on top of us. And 2020 was a year where we kind of crossed the chasm where by 2020, most of the people at Airbnb recognize uh, Minerva as the single sort of truth for metrics. And I, I would say that like a metric store is interesting that like it also has network effect that like the more metrics and dimensions that you add it to to the metric resp- repository, the more incentive for people to use it, right? Because the activation energy for them to adopt the technology and the chance of them finding something useful for their particular use cases just lower significantly. And so Minerva has been very successful for various reasons. One is because of the general kind of company direction where we we're trying to go public we need to we need to harden our data quality that definitely helped the fact that we were able to partner with important stakeholders that owns important use cases that also helped and then finally the network effect also is another big reason why minerva has been adopted very widely across the company so we're very humble and, and very happy that uh, you know this this concept really materialized at airbnb Yeah, no, it seems really foundational to all the work that you do at Airbnb. It seems more like a hub and spoke model where Minerva is the central nervous system where all your other systems really plug into, whether it's your BI layer through Superset or your experimentation layer, finance, what have you. You know, I I think it's really interesting. Our users don't have Minerva at their companies, but they often will use Looker. And Looker has decided to make the metrics layer tightly coupled with the visualization layer. And I'm curious how you think about whether the metrics layer should be separate or if it's okay to keep it kind of tightly integrated with other systems that are the consumers. Yeah, that's actually a very, very good question. We have the luxury to build a very tight integration between Minerva and Superset because Superset was, you know, it's an open source project, but it, but it started off at Airbnb and we are able to do a lot of customization work to integrate Minerva with Superset. But Superset is just one of the many BI tools out there. And I would admit that, you know, internally when we have discussions around how do we make sure that Minerva can work well with other BI tools that's not homegrown, there's definitely challenges. For example, how do we actually make sure that Minerva data can be surfaced into tools like Tableau? It's not very clear how that can be done. And I I think to build that bridge, a very important requirement is consistency. And this might require a little bit of explanations into some of the details, but maybe I'll go, I will not go there. But I think in essence is when you have all these different metric types and all these nuances at the business level. For example, uh, I'll give one example maybe. So a nice book as a metric is what we call a simple metric where it's basically summable. Like if you compute Knight's book each day, you can just sum them and then you can report the total bookings by the end of the week. And that's pretty simple, right? But simple metric, what we call simple metric, summable metrics is not the only type of metric that exists in the business world. Like median price, you can't sum up median price. Exactly. You can sum a median price. And an even simpler example could be Airbnb. We, we really care about the number of active listings on the platform. So active listing is what we call a snapshot metric. So you can't really, if you are trying to report the total number of active listings by the end of the week, you can't sum up the number of active listings seven days because you'll be overcounting seven times. So a lot of this really boils down to aggregation logic. How do you translate from events to an actual metric? The bridge between events and metric is aggregation. And depending on the type of the metric that you're dealing with, the aggregation might be different. And so I think this is something that is doesn't really drive well with like the modern day BI tools because a lot of the BI tools assume that you start with tables and then you can like build your aggregations however you want. For example, like in mode, you can like write some SQL queries, you write your own aggregation, and then that will turn into a metric. So so how do you bridge that gap between like the events to the metric itself and then make everything consistent is is definitely a big challenge. And I think that I don't think that is a completely solved problem, to be honest. 
Because when we built Minerva, we, we had a pretty set vision on how it might integrate with the rest of the data stack at Airbnb. And so it wasn't really an enterprise software that we would, you know, integrate with all possible BI tools out there. But there are definitely startups that are trying to, to do this. And, and I think some of their approach is to try to build things like a JDBC driver, uh, make sure that they have some sort of API endpoints that different BI tools can talk to. So the good news is that I think people who are trying to build a similar concept as a commercial software, like enterprise software, has recognized that and is trying to fix that. But this is definitely something that we came across when we built Minerva Airbnb. Hey everyone, just dropping in to let you know that the annual Analytics Engineering Conference, Coalesce, is back. We had the first Coalesce last year in December, and it was fantastic. We had 3,000 registrants, tons of presentations, and this year is going to be even bigger. Register for free at coalesce.getdbt.com. With your integration with Superset, do you work off a fork, and does that fork then like have a, a like really tight coupling with Minerva? I don't think that I could just download the trunk superset and have it work in that same way. Is that right? Yeah, you're right. So okay. we do have our own fork. And, and so a lot of the custom work actually is not, it doesn't go back to the, the same open source project. That's what I would imagine you would have. To, I mean, other companies could do that too. They could, they could fork superset and, and build custom stuff on top of it. I have always been trying to think of how to solve that problem because I, I think it really is the big question of like, how do you make this stuff actionable in the BI layer? So that, that makes a lot of sense that, that you folks went that way. Right. And I, I think especially the integration with BI layer is, is not only fundamental, but it's also the trickiest. There are other applications that are, you can say, easier. Like, for example, we have Airbnb or the Airbnb's forecasting model integrates with Minerva really well. And all we need to do is we will surface them the time series, aggregated time series data. They call our API, they get that back in a data frame, and then they can just do whatever data processing that they need, and then they can build their forecast and prediction. So there are definitely like a class of applications that as long as you have an API on point, you're done. But I think for BI, the integration of BI tools, that's definitely like the harder problem. And that's also sort of the most important problem, if you will, because most people start not with like fancy forecasting, but they start with like having a BI tool, which you can visualize and understand trends. Yeah, we think about it a lot at DBT too. You know, we're the model layer. We want to define things once. We want to be where the business logic sits and is defined in your data warehouse and thinking about all the other kind of end stream, how people consume that logic is really important to us as well. It's hard to get right. But what I'm hearing from you is keep them separate as best you can. Like don't try to define it in many different forms. You don't want to couple your metrics with the end consumer, which is the super set in your case, the BI system. What should companies that aren't Airbnb do, right? They don't have teams where the resources took you four years to get Minerva built. Should small teams care about it? Should they build something in-house? Are there other alternatives? Where does it sit in that hierarchy of needs that you described? It's like, you, you should go work at Airbnb. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I mean, again, I haven't had a ton of experience working in smaller startups, but I can imagine how things will progress based on my experience at Twitter and Airbnb. But I, I think in general, it goes back to what we discussed earlier. I think when you have a some sort of data warehouse data lake that's built on top of Snowflake, let's say, I think the first question is, Probably not how do you standardize the metric? I think probably the first step is to do table standardization. And so it just goes back to Monica's data hierarchy of needs. I think you kind of tend to build things layer upon layers. And so I would say to the extent that you can try to solve and try to tackle table standardization first. And that probably means that you should have talents who are very strong at data modeling skills, people who can translate the business questions into metrics and dimensions and the associated entities and then do the corresponding mo data modeling. And then once you build out a set of highly vetted, high quality core data tables, hopefully using tools like DBT, then you can then start to, that's like one step forward to building standardization in your warehouse. And once you have those tables, then naturally you would probably start to see some of the problems that we experience in Airbnb. 
But I think that the important thing is before the advantage of having table standardization is enormous and it will buy you years to come. At Airbnb, we had quarter at table that we, the pre Minerva, that paradigm of, you know, everything is centered around core data lasted for five, six years. And so just having table standardization actually takes you a long way. And I think as the company and as the organization become more and more mature, then you will start to see the need of having metric standardization. Of course, if there are technology that enables everyone to skip the middle step, the table standardization, go straight to the metric standardization, that would be even better. But I actually haven't seen that out there. And I I just think that this is still, it's a pretty novel, pretty new concept. People welcome the idea, but it's not very clear how exactly the same success can be replicated into different organizations. And, you know, just because we have been somewhat successful at Airbnb, I would not claim that this can be easily done in other organizations, even though I do believe in this idea. So is your work done? Have you fixed all the problems where there's still things that need to be tackled? Oh, no, we're, we're just getting started. There, there are so many things that we can still do. For example, Minerva has been very successful in supporting use cases like reporting, experimentation, analytics, but business analytics, I should say. And, and there's actually more and more demands from users across the company asking questions such as, well, we have the customer support group and we would like to leverage the same single source of truth data to do operations analytics. We would like to understand, you know, if there are a particular segment of users who uh, are running into troubles and we want to be able to triage quickly and we want to get the treasure trove of all the data about our users in order to tailor and customize their service. Similarly, so operations analytics, I think it, it, it's a big area that is largely on tap and we haven't been able to support yet, but look forward to. And it's not hard to imagine that maybe in the future, some of the single source of truth data, especially derived data that's computed in Minerva, can be pushed back to the product. So, for example, at Airbnb, if you're a host, we have a product called Host Dashboard that shows you earnings and bookings and revenue, stuff like that. All those things at the moment, the underlying data, computed data needs to be built in a customized manner. So you can imagine if you have some sort of data st- metric store, then you can just query that metric store and you can get all that data and you can serve it in product. And that would be really amazing. I believe that's what LinkedIn did. They have a similar system called UMP. And it's also a metric store. And eventually, they also expanded their use cases beyond just business analytics. And, and some, of, some of the metrics is being used to power applications that's actually in product. And then last but not least, I haven't seen this being done in a lot of companies. But I do think there is opportunities for consolidation between what we call feature engineering and, and metric engineering, where at Airbnb, we currently have two systems. We have a feature store called Zipline that's specific for machine learning. And then we have a metric store called Minerva that's specific for analytics experimentation. It's not crazy to think that maybe there are some opportunities to consolidate the computation and aggregation engine. I haven't seen that in other companies yet, but that's something that we're exploring. And I think if we can do that right, then that really will help us to live up to our vision statement of define one's user everywhere. We're going to close out with a fun question. You know, looking 10 years out, what do you hope to be true for the data industry? Oh, that's a great question. I'll make a broad statement first. I hope that the infrastructure and toolings that exist to enable data scientists, data analysts, data professionals to turn data into insights or values or models, whatever it is, would be significantly easier than today. And I hope that the industry at large would learn a lot more from some of the battle tested software development principles from software engineering. I I see that data science is, there's a lot of potential, but sometimes I feel like our field is limited or crippled by the fact that there is no standardized workflow, there's no standardized tooling. And a lot of the things that we do don't follow best practices because there's no best practices. And I hope that in 10 years, when we look back, we will say, oh, yeah, I mean, it's obvious that we should version control our SQL queries or that oh, it's obvious that we should have data quality checks. And I think a lot of these are already happening. You guys are also pushing the frontier. And 
I think a lot of it is just because data science was so new. And then people are just in the old days, just, well, I just write SQL query. And then maybe I do build some model in a Jupyter notebook and <laughs> nothing, no workflow is standardized. And I hope that by having more people, more brain to pour their brain power and resources into standardizing all these things, we can have a set of best practices that's unambiguous, that's clear, and it has a lot of, and it brings a lot of efficiency and goods to people's day-to-day -day work. So that turning data into insight is no longer a expensive pursuit where you have to hire some fancy people who have specialized skills to do. It's something that is a lot more approachable and, and sensible. And at the same time, I think if we can do that, it will also enable the data professionals to be more creative because then you don't, you can spend less time doing the grind work and you can spend more time thinking about the business problem. And then if you have toolings that all work together, then that also expanded your capability to turn data into value. And so maybe in the future, it's not just about doing data modeling and then in the end you produce a report. Maybe it is that the same work that you do can go into a report that can also be used in experimentation and you can easily build data products. And I think Minerva and the concept of metric store of defined ones used everywhere kind of is trying to basically live up to that ideal. But I don't know, maybe I'm being too ambitious, but I hope that in 10 years, this will be what the data landscape looks like. Hey, Robert, can I throw one more gotcha in there? I know that everybody asks you this, I'm sure. Airbnb has this reputation for these massive open source successful projects. Is Minerva going to be one of them? That's a great question. That is certainly a topic that we are discussing internally. We hope that at some point we will be able to do it, but there is no fixed timeline on when that will happen. Sure. But sorry, I had to ask it. You, you know, I had to. <laughs> I apologize for all the venture capitalists who will now be in your inbox. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Robert, before you head out, share where listeners can find out more about you. For those who are interested in reading some of my past writings, you can check me out on the Medium. My handle is rchang, R-C-H-A-N-G. Perfect. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's been really a pleasure to chat with you about this. And really, I think that you have more posts on this coming out in the future. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. We have two more. Very, very excited to read what you have, have to share. The Analytics Engineering Podcast is sponsored by DBT Labs and is hosted by Tristan Handy and myself, Julia Schottenstein. Have comments, questions, or guest suggestions? Email us at podcast at dbtlabs.com. Our producers are Jeff Fox and David Krevit. If you enjoy the show, please drop a review or share it with a friend. Thanks for listening.